Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to Rereading Together. This is our new series that we're going to be doing for Adult Sunday School, um, maybe in perpetuity. It won't be in actual perpetuity, but we're going to be doing it for a while. We don't know how long yet. Um, we'll start with probably six or eight weeks or something and uh, see how you all respond to it, um, whether you enjoy it, engage with, um, with us in doing it. Um, what we're aiming at here is a conversation about the scriptures. Hopefully in the process, we'll make you laugh. We might make you cry. Hopefully we'll make you think, wonder, and want to read more of the Bible. Um, our goal is to read and interpret in community. And this is an attempt at doing just that in a fun way. Jordan and I are going to take kind of a conversational podcasty sort of approach to this. Um, each week, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to have a conversation about an entire book of the Bible. Jordan and I will have read the entire book front to back um, before we come to meet together, but we won't have compared any of our notes. Um, so we'll be bringing our own thoughts, our own reflections, our own interpretations to this metaphorical table and bouncing them off of one another. Um, as a way of sort of formatting that conversation, we've picked some fun categories to kind of pick out of each biblical book uh, that we read together. So I'm just going to name those categories off for you. Don't worry about remembering them. We're going to return to them each week. So you'll get to know them as you engage with this material on a weekly basis. So the first one is called The Past is the Past. And in The Past is the Past, we want to try to, what was that? I was just, I was, <laughs> you, you were just having engaging. some gesticulation, like Good. the past is the past. The past is the past. Um, in, in this category, we're going to try to pick out one bit of background information to the book um, from the historical context that we think is important to being able to read well and interpret well um, this particular book. The second category we're calling tweet it. So that's the most quotable, tweetable verse in the whole book. It's got to be less than 280 characters. We're going to stick it into Twitter just to make sure that it's less than 280 characters. Tweet it. Third category is fish out of water. What's the verse or the passage or the theme in this particular book that is most often taken out of context or maybe misquoted uh, or, or, or used in a way that it wasn't sort of intended to be used by the author when it was originally written? The fourth category is called ancient connection. Um, what was the what was one of the most prominent takeaways for uh, the ancient Israelites or the early church, depending on if it was an Old Testament book or a New Testament book? That's ancient connection. We're also going to do a category called contemporary connection. What do we think is the most important takeaway for us as a church in America in the 21st century? Last two categories. The first one is phone a friend. Each of Jordan and I will be bringing another voice to this table and kind of saying this person had an interesting take on this part of the book. It might be a commentary that someone has written. It might be an article that either Jordan or I has read. It might be a sermon or a blog post. Who knows? It'll be something from outside uh, Jordan and I's kind of thoughts. And then the last one we'll tackle is MVP, Most Valuable Passage. What's the most valuable passage? If we were going to summarize this whole book, if we were going to boil it down to a few verses, where would we land? Um, what would we choose to kind of get this whole book into uh, a, just a few verses? So those are the categories we're going to tackle. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun with it. Hopefully you'll have a little bit of fun with it. We would love for you to engage in this with us as well. Um, so we may be reaching out to some of you, ask you to answer one or two of these questions so that we can throw them onto uh, the weekly Sunday school lesson. Um, but we're excited about this. We're gonna have some fun with it. We're calling it rereading together and we hope you'll have some fun with it too. So Jordan, let's get started. This week we are tackling Philippians. We decided to start off a, a little bit easier. Yeah, we're exploring right? the New Testament letters that, and um, yeah, we're exploring New Testament letters. Yeah. So the starting with the New Testament letters was an easy place for us to start. First of all, they're shorter. Mm -hmm. So reading the whole book mm -hmm. is not a huge task. We didn't start with Genesis or Isaiah, for example, um, longest books in the Bible. Um, so we started with a shorter one. We mm -hmm. started with one that both of us are kind of familiar with. We probably both preached out of a couple of passages of Philippians, um, things like that. Um, so just to kind of get us rolling, um, what was your kind of overall impression of reading Philippians start to finish? Yeah, I, I think it's 
often as Timothy and Titus are talked about as the pastoral epistles, mm -hmm. that these are sort of the ones that are written to young pastors to like encourage them in their faith. And when you think more traditionally about maybe the Corinthians or Romans, it's that Paul is addressing questions that have been asked directly to him mm -hmm. or kind of situations he's heard about. And um, like there's drunk people at communion services. Right. And there's all this sort of mystery and sexual behavior going on that would make anybody cringe. But Philippians is much more about um, Paul's sort of musings on what his relationship with Jesus means to him mm. and, and how he's changed his life. So he's not necessarily addressing a problem or answering a question. He's, he's reflecting on, and he, write the, he writes this from jail. Yep. Um, Epaphrodites was with a gentleman that came to him to give him an offering yeah. from the church in Philippi, he gave him some money, maybe some pub subs or whatever he came to, to give him. And, and this is what he gives him in return. He's, he's like, these are it, this, it, it's a, a blog post. Yeah. It, it's like, it's Paul's musings on um, what has his relationship with Jesus meant to him. Mm -hmm. um, and as he sits in his cell and he has time to reflect on his life before, his, his Jewishness, how that's come into context through Jesus redeeming all things and what that means for how we should live our life as Christians. Yeah. So I, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's as much of a dive into to Paul as like Romans or, or Corinthians would be. Mm -hmm. And I think we often think of Paul as like the theologian. Mm. He's like the thinker. He's the one we go to to get our theology straight. But Philippians is um, a, a rare sort of glimpse into 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 him as Paul. Yeah. But I think that says more about how we we've misread Paul mm. to to read him theologi the, uh, theologically as opposed to experience him as a as a radically changed person. Yeah. Yeah. And a remind that's a, such a good reminder that like each of these letters is situational in some way. And so this one might be situational in a different way than Romans mm -hmm. is or than First Corinthians. Mm -hmm. It's answering different questions. Mm -hmm. It arises mm -hmm. from a different context. Mm -hmm. um, but in Philippians, we get a little bit of a glimpse into Paul and he's in jail. He's reflecting on his own ministry, his apostleship, right. all of these things. And it's going to it's like off the cuff almost like yeah. there, there's no like there, there's no agenda to the meeting. Uh, yeah. to, to the letter mm -hmm. like he's not addressing a problem he's not responding to another letter and he's like giving this as as a letter to Epaphrodite to take back to the church there as an encouragement to them mm. yeah no that's good um I was struck kind of overall impression by uh by the recurring theme of joy which we might come back to in right. a minute mm -hmm. um, in a couple of these categories that we're going to um, answer. But I, I just, from the start of the letter to the end of the letter, it's joy this, joy that, mm -hmm. and then everywhere that it's not joy, it's rejoice, right? right? So um, it, this theme just returns over and over again. And whatever Paul is talking about in the letter, as he traces from start to finish, um, this one kind of story about himself and relationship with the church at Philippi, um, he's just constantly returning to joy and rejoicing. Um, and that just really hit me. It was a reminder to me, and part of the reason why we're doing this series anyway, is reading a book from start to finish, you get a different impression of it than mm -hmm. if you were just like, today my daily reading is Philippians 1, 9 to 14. And right. It's like, that's good. Do, do that. That's great. Um, but also sometimes sitting down and reading a whole book of the Bible from start to finish, we can get a bigger picture. Um, and this theme of joy was one of the kind of bigger and, pictures. And we've kind of hammered this home that verses and chapters are an addition 1,500 years after the yeah. So, so to read things piecemeal um, was not how they've meant to be, how, it's just not how things were meant to be read. It was like if I took Drew's phone and went to his text with Brittany mm -hmm. and just scrolled and picked one. And I was like, this is how Drew and Brittany's relationship is. Right. And it's like, you forgot the Pashwari man. <laughs> Shame on you. And I'm like, whoa. So it's the funny thing, Indus did forget the Peshwari knot. <laughs> That's why I'm saying I had a conversation uh, with Brittany, she told me. And it was it was nearly the end of right. a lot of things. <laughs> but it's it's like that's a ridiculous example. Like we're like obviously you can't infer about their love for one another from one text. Yeah. But when when we just focus in on a few verses here or a few verses there. And so it's doubly removed. It's removed yeah. from the literary context of the rest of the letter and even the rest of Paul, the rest of Jesus, sure. and in the rest of the historical context. Yeah. So it, it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's a real rhythm to, um, to see the wood from the trees. Sometimes, yeah. To kind of to, to step back and see it all. Yeah, it's good. 
All right, let's get into some categories. So um, we're starting with the past is the past. What do you think is the most important bit of background information um, for reading this book well, understanding it? Two things, I think. So I think the first, it was Paul, it was the first church in Europe. So the, the first ch church in modern day Europe, and it was in uh, what would now be Macedonia. And you can read more about that in Acts um, 16. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and because of that, it was a very pro-Rome part of the world and a part of the world where Rome was very patriotic and they would have loved 4th of July in, yeah. in Philippi. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think those are the two things. Because often we, we, we preach for this all the time. It, it's the, the subversion of Rome. Jesus is power challenge to Rome. Mm -hmm. And like the, 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 the opposition of Jesus as Lord to Caesar as Lord. And, and those two as like a, a challenge for a citizen to make. Yeah. And that that would have been a very difficult message to preach in Philippi. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's good. Um, we, we often think of... Um, we think of letters like the Corinthian letters or the Galatian letters, which are written to churches that are um, in the Roman Empire, but not sort of distinctly Roman. So Philippi sits in what is now modern day Italy. Mm -hmm. so, so that kind of helps us to think about mm -hmm. it in, in proximity to mm -hmm. Rome. Um, whereas Corinth sits in modern day Greece. Mm -hmm. um, Galatia sits in modern day mm -hmm. Turkey, mm -hmm. um, the region of Galatia. Um, so, so Philippi is, is proximately closer to Rome, um, but is also one of these like properly Roman colonial cities. Um, and so it, it has this very pro-Roman thing going on. Um, and so anything we find in Philippians that might kind of just cut against a little bit um, that sort of imperial mm -hmm. vibe, um, it, I think would have resounded all the more in the Philippian mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. um, the only other thing I would mention is, that you mentioned earlier is that Paul's in prison um, when he writes this. And that particularly helps us to understand some of chapter one and some of chapter four, where Paul's talking about being prevented from going to mm -hmm. see them. Um, he's talking about uh, the, the gospel spreading even right. while he's in chains. Um, and so, so just understanding kind of the context of where Paul's at in his ministry. Um, Philippians is almost certainly written much later in Paul's ministry, um, maybe even after what we know of his third missionary journey from Acts. Um, so this is a late letter. For Paul. No. It's good. All right. Uh, let's move on to tweet it. How about your most your most tweetable verse? What did you come uh, up with? I went chapter two, six through eleven. Can you get six through eleven in two hundred and eighty characters? I don't know. Well, I the, and can, uh, it takes into account punctuation, right? In Twitter. <laughs> yeah, it's spaces, uh, punctuation, everything. You've got you've so, only got two hundred and eighty characters. Okay, definitely not. It's one hundred and forty seven words. Okay. On um, okay, so maybe I'll um. Okay, let's just do the last three verses. You could probably right. wait for that. And, All right. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth. Hashtag and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's a long hashtag. It um, it's a good choice, though. Why did why, you choose that one as your, as your go-to tweet? From I feel like that, that's... Um, it's in the center of the the text of Philippi, uh, of Philippians, and it's it's a it's a hymn almost. It's a refrain, mm -hmm. and and it's kind of what Paul um, centers his letter around. Yeah, um, and I think that that's that sums up that um, no matter. I am in a jail cell right now, and mm -hmm. um, experiencing extreme hunger, beatings, persecution, but in the context of Jesus making all things new, this is all I can say. Mm. That's good. So, so like he can only be joyful, like you said, yeah, because of God making all things new. Mm. I like that. That's good. Uh, I went with Philippians one verse six. Okay. Um, so uh, just just a single verse, um, and uh, I, it gets under two hundred eighty characters. Um, and and Paul says it like this. Uh, this is from the ESV translation. I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it, bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, and actually tying in a little bit with what you just said about the 9, 10, 11 in chapter two, um, this is kind of, Paul's in prison. He knows he's been in, in a certain sense removed from his congregations that he once visited, mm. that he still longs to visit, um, maybe even that he planted, founded mm. these churches. Um, and so, coming from that perspective he's saying 
what do I still put my trust in? Well, I still put my trust in the fact that Jesus who began the good work, it wasn't me who mm -hmm. began the good work, mm -hmm. Paul, is Jesus who began the good work and he'll carry it on to completion. Um, and I love that idea. And, and I think the, the good work resonating back to sort of the whole story of redemption of Israel. Mm. And I think that's something that Paul continuously brings home is connect. And, and this last part of the verse I just read there is connected to Isaiah 45. Yeah. And sort of the, the hopes of um, the world being restored through the son of promise from Israel. Yeah. That's good. Good stuff. Um, okay. How about fish out of water? I have a, I have a certain suspicion that we might agree on this one, but what'd you pick out as uh, the most misquoted or taken out of context part of Philippians? Four, six through seven. Okay. Is that different from you? It is different actually. I'm in chapter four, Okay. but give me, give us six yeah. through seven. Uh, What's do that? not be anxious about anything, but in every situation and by prayer and petition with Thanksgiving, present your requests to God. All right, and I and I think on on two, on two levels. One on like a, a, a clinical health level of, of that um the, the the stigma of anxiety and depression as being sort of a, a spiritual thing mm -hmm. of that um just pray it pray it away pray it away, but of like actually our our mental health and our our, our emotional health and our physical health are are connected things. Right, and, and we, we should treat them with the professional care that they deserve. So I think specifically in that context, I think that that's um, misused, but also the latter half of it, it, it can lead in sort of the, the materialism and the prosperity of, and um, God will give you anything you desire if your faith is in the right place and you, and you pray enough and ask for it. Mm. That's good. That's good. Uh, my fish out of water is from a little bit later in chapter four. It's verse 13. Um, it's a very famous verse. I can do all things through Christ who and strengthens I, and I me. And I thought you would go, what's his face? The, the thrower guy? Um, <laughs> Tebow, Tim Tebow, right? He, he, had, he had those. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. that was one of the yeah. one of the very common yeah. things that yeah. Tim Tebow would put yeah. on his uh, on his eye black back in the day. Um, John 3.16 was another yeah. one. But yes, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Um, which... Well, Tim Tebow is a good example. I mean, what, what are, what's the application there? I can throw touchdowns through Christ who strengthens <laughs> me. The other one I saw growing up was um, there was this group, and some of you will probably remember groups like this, um, called the A-Team, who would travel around, and they were basically like a bodybuilding team. Um, like and Mr. they would they would travel around like Mr. T or what, what it, like they, they would travel around and do their bodybuilding stuff. It would be like you know we throw pallets of bricks back and forth to one another, or one of them would like smash some cement blocks with their forearm. And <laughs> in the background, like the the giant banner that would yeah. be on the stage when they were doing their show was a giant banner that said like a team and then it would be philippians 4 13 <laughs> i can do all things through christ who strengthens me and it was just it was it was always one of those where i'm just like i i don't think that's what paul is talking about and even if we bring paul into the 21st century which i think we should do i still think it's a bad application is that a uniquely oklahoman I don't know. I think that? it. Was, I don't know. It could have been uniquely Bible Belt, but okay. I don't think it was uniquely Oklahoma. Maybe we could bring the A team to Memorial. <laughs> Do you think they're still around? They're, they're probably still around. I don't think there's enough space in here. That would, it was like massive stage production. When I have my, an ordination service, I want the That'd A team there. That'd be great. Instead, instead, what we find in <laughs> chapter four is Paul talking about something like contentment. Um, and he is thanking the Philippians for the gifts that they've sent. As you said, Epaphroditus brought some money mm. along um, from the Philippian church to give to Paul that was, was financial support for him while he was under house arrest in prison in Rome. Um, and so uh, he's giving thanks to them for their gifts. And he says, I know what it has been to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. Um, so the idea is whether you're finding yourselves in trials, whether you Philippians are finding yourselves under persecution from the Roman empire, Christ gives us strength for all of mm -hmm. those things. It's not about bodybuilding or throwing touchdowns. And I think perhaps that's the most, revealing way of how we read and um, the text is that when paul writes i we read me sure yeah no i think that's good yeah no you're right about that okay what about an ancient connection 
uh, what do you think is one of the one of the most important takeaways that the uh, Philippian church? Um, did we skip ancient connection? We went for, oh, ancient connection. Here we go. I, I think it's the, the Isaiah forty five. Okay. Uh, undertones. Tell us again. And, well, the, the hope that the, the ultimate the, the son of promise would um, be a son of promise for the whole world, okay. and the whole world would be restored and healed through Israel's son of promise, through their Messiah. And, and clearly that, that's seen in Jesus. Yeah. And what we see in the very, again, of the, the last few verses of uh, 2, 6, and 11 are directly from Isaiah 45. Mm. That's good. That's good. Um, I'm going to go kind of to, to chapter 2 as well and that key passage, um, because I, I think the, the ancient peoples of Philippi um, would have heard this idea of Jesus humbling himself of making himself mm. nothing, of taking on the very nature of a servant. Um, and they would have heard that then with the last three verses mm. that you read a minute ago of Jesus then being exalted because of mm. being willing to humble himself in that way. Then God exalts him um, and gives him the name that is above every name. They would have heard that, I think, as a direct contrast to who Caesar was. So Caesar is the one who comes with all the military might, with all the political power, mm -hmm. with all the, I can force you to do this because I have all the resources and you have none of the resources. Mm -hmm. um, if Caesar is all just power down on top of. And what we see is Jesus humbling himself and coming underneath mm -hmm. um, and then being exalted mm -hmm. from that place of humiliation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that really would have resounded in their ears, not just as an anti-imperial statement, but more of just a contrast of this is who we early church now worship is right. this person who is humble and is a servant. And more explicitly, the, the humiliation of the cross and yeah. the humiliation of, and the men's group have been discussing this some of just the utter humiliation that crucifixion was. Yeah. That Roman citizens weren't allowed to be crucified the soldiers that did the crucifixion were foreigners and they were probably from Iran. Most scholars think that they, mm. they were removed. Like the Romans weren't even like Roman citizens from, from like the heart of Rome weren't allowed to be the soldiers that crucified people. Right. Because it was so abhorrent to um, their view of how like life ended. Yeah. That they removed it on every level from Rome. Yeah. Um, and only reserved it for traitors and yeah. those that directly challenged Rome. And, and again, Drew, the, the flip of that, and the the messiah that you that rome so defiled and denigrated um, and humiliated is in fact the one that's raised to be the name above all names yeah yeah where it is like the, the crucified not the crucifier is the one that has the power mm. that's good that's good uh what about contemporary connection what do you think is the best takeaway for us as a 21st century church I, I think it's a radical challenge to nationalism and allegiance to nation over Jesus. Okay. Um, and, and I think that um, obviously it, it's a question that lots of countries are wrestling with just now is um, like my homeland. And um, the big question just now is Brexit. It's that, well, Britain's for Britain. Like why, why should Bulgarians get a job over a British person? Like the British person should have it. Right. We've seen that here the past four years and it's continued to be here and Brazil, Russia, like you, you throw a dark world map, there's, there's nationalistic and um, politicians on the rise. Yeah. France, Marion Le Pen with Le Front National mm -hmm. and really right, right, right wing stuff. Yeah. But like they're a party that's on the rise. Yeah. And, and I think it, it's a conversation and um, that as our world becomes more global, um, there's, there's no greater sign of globalization than a pandemic being able to like, yeah, shut down the world. Yeah. That I, I, food market in Wuhan, China results to a year long lockdown in the world. You're right. like, how did that happen? It's because right. we're also interconnected. And, and as an opposite force, that interconnectedness as all humans as one made in the image of God, it's, it's um, autonomous, autonomous, autonomous national identity sort of surviving and fighting. Mm. And it's a conversation that's on rise in pretty much every country in the world. Mm. As there, there's conversations of restoring pride in nation, being a good citizen of like whatever country. Yeah. And, and often that's, that's like, that's like ugly nationalism. Yeah. And, and, and I think we, we can see some sort of tones like here in the States today, but, but I do think that, um, yeah, it, it's a radical challenge to, to us as Christians is how, how do we participate in, in civic life and our life as a nation when um, loyalty to the nation seems to, and be a really important thing and an expected thing. Yeah, yeah.
And, and like, in, in contrast to that, we, we have Paul saying, uh, but our citizenship is in heaven. Right. Um, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies right. so that we feel like his right. glorious body. Right. Yeah. Right. Our right. citizenship is in heaven. Right. And there's a huge contrast for the Philippians right. and for us. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's like an outsider perspective. And when I learned about American government in college, it was like church and state separate. Mm -hmm. And then, like, American kids, they swear allegiance to the flag every morning. Right. I'm like, as an insider, I'm like, I've, that's just kind of, like, it's kind of strange. Sure. And not to, like, beat it off or make any greater point. It, it's just, it, as a practice, I'm like, okay. Yeah. Like, there, there's, there's an expectation that for you, wherever you've come from, whatever you believe, for you to participate in society here, being um, pro-country, it is a big part of it yeah. and not critiquing it is something that's expected. Yeah, that's good. Uh, my contemporary connection is about privilege because mm -hmm. um, Paul goes into this long section in chapter three about letting go of mm -hmm. his privileges, mm -hmm. like the things that he could have counted as gain. He now counts as rubbish. I mean, he uses a four letter word in Greek, right? Um, and, and it's like trash, just right. the, 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 you know, it's nothing to me. And all of these things could have been counted as gain to me. And that, that really resonated with me, not just with the conversations we've had um, recently about kind of privilege as it relates to race and ethnicity. Um, but Paul here is hitting on categories that we wouldn't even normally think of as privilege of sorts. Um, he's talking about the privilege of, of having a good upbringing. He says he was circumcised on the eighth day. You, you can't circumcise yourself. Your parents do that. Right. So what he's saying is, I was born into a good right. family. Right. I had good parents uh -huh. who brought me up uh -huh. right. So go a good upbringing is one of the privileges he wants to let go of. Um, his ethnicity as a good Jew, he's got to let go of. Um, his education, he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Not everyone got education past the age of 11 or 12 or something, um, especially not the girls. Yeah, but the, the Ivy League. PhD, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. He was he was the most educated person. He had a good job and he did it well. So he's talking about letting go of his zeal mm -hmm. for persecuting the Christians, which was his job mm -hmm. in the Jewish religious mm -hmm. environment. Um, and then even his moral standing, he says he's blameless before the law. That now is rubbish to him. That mm -hmm. now is of no gain to him. That is a loss. Um, and those ideas of, of letting go of mm -hmm. those things in order to know the power of Christ and his mm -hmm. resurrection and mm -hmm. to share in his sufferings, that's mm -hmm. what Paul contrasts mm -hmm. it with. Um, that idea is, uh, is a real big challenge to right. me and I think to us as American Christians in the 21st century. And, and I think it's connected to our expectation of privilege as being um, part of an extremely wealthy yeah. um, society on, on the top of it. I read an article just this morning that um, 160 countries in the world have not received one single COVID vaccination. Wow. And, and less than 20% of the world's population have consumed 90% of the vaccines in the world. Wow. And it's that sort of the, the privilege we just have of being on sort of the top of the pile. Yeah. And um, it's something that we just totally take for granted. Yeah. And we mm -hmm. see like obviously all the horrific stuff going on in Texas just now with like access to water yeah. and like it makes national news stories for us that however many million of people don't have access to water, yeah. but hundreds of millions of people across the world today have never had access to water. Right. And that's like every day for them. Yeah. 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 All right. Last category, uh, MVP. What's your most valuable passage from this book of Philippians? Born a friend. Oh, we forgot phone a friend. Phone a friend. Thank you um, so much. Phone a friend. I, Which friend are you phoning? I, I'm phoning the esteemed Lynn Coy. All right. Um, so she, she is, she's a, uh, she's made her ground as a Pauline scholar, mm -hmm. but she's focused explicitly on um, women and children in Paul mm -hmm. and sort of his, his understanding of, of the family and as a family unit. And there, there's a, it's called the story of God series and um, which um, we have a copy of um, here. And so it, this series is excellent because the series really, we, we've often, and when we want to read a commentary or a text, it's, we're, we're expert, it's what are the theological things we can learn from the culture, the text? Yeah. Well, the story of God Technical is- Technical things. Exactly. Yeah. The story of God is, is how can we immerse ourselves in, in, in it as a story, like arcing from Genesis to Revelation? 
but also just in the material life of the church family then. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, it just reads the text differently. Um, and I really enjoyed her perspective on kind of like Paul as like a pastor inviting mm -hmm. people to reflect, like you said, on, on the joy that they can experience and putting whatever's going on in their life into the context of God's redeeming story. Yeah, that's good. Um, ironically, we did not compare notes. I also have a, a phone a friend from Lynn Coick yeah. um, and this commentary in the Story of God Bible Commentary series. Um, I just want to read uh, a, a little section here from uh, pages 103 and 104. Um, and, and this is about the idea uh, in the passage before um, the, the verses that Jordan picked out as, as tweeted earlier. Um, we have Paul talking about uh, how to honor one another, um, how to put the other above ourselves in the first few verses of chapter two. Um, and Lynn Coit talks about those verses and asks the question, how often do we feel less valued or honored, even slighted, when we hear someone else get praised? We are reluctant to give honor to another or praise another from our heart because we imagine that honor is a set quantity. It is like a glass full of water or a bucket full of sand. As we sip the water or shovel out the sand, the amount grows less. So this idea that we, we often resist giving praise to each other or we often, more, more often I think we don't like seeing other people get praised because we view honor and praise as a limited quantity. That if Dr. Grins mm. is saying, Jordan, you did a really good job this Sunday doing whatever you did, that means I must have not done a good job because there's only a certain amount of praise that Dr. Grins has to give. And he gave some of it to you, which means I'm not mm. getting some of it. And, and that idea of honor and praise is not what we see anywhere in scripture. Like it's coming from culture or something in, in the way that we process how that works in our com competition and rivalry kind of culture. Um, and in fact, what we find is Paul encouraging the Philippian church to do this mutually for one another. If everyone's offering praise and everyone's lifting up the other above themselves, then all of a sudden everyone's getting lifted up. No one's getting left behind. Um, and this idea of kind of honor and praise as a set quantity, I thought that was really interesting. Right. And just how often we view and interact with the world in terms of kind of scarcity and um, just the desire to keep things, sustaining things. Yeah. And um, whereas like Paul has nothing in a prison cell. Yeah. And yet he's saying, I have the most abundant life. Right. And um, all I can do is praise God for these circumstances. Yeah. And we're like, why? Yeah. How can you say that? <laughs> No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Okay, MVP. What you? What, what's your most valuable passage? I, I think it was, it was it was connected to, and you actually alluded to in terms of like the context of um, navigating um, nationalism. Um, it, it's three twenty, um, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Christ, whom by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies, so they will be like his glorious body. And so it's a double fold of um, all we experience here isn't all that there is. Mm. And, and, that, and God, through his redemption in Jesus, is, is renewing our physical bodies. And often we, we think about that as, as in like heaven, but, but it's the, the material makeup of earth is being renewed as the kingdom comes more and more proximate. That's good. It's good. My, my MVP um, is one that you've already alluded to. It's chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, um, and we've already read most of it, so I won't reread it, but the one thing I do want to say about this passage, aside from it being beautiful and poetic and, and um, all of those things, I'd encourage you, if, if you do anything, just go and read uh, the first part of chapter 2 in Philippians. Um, but one thing we sometimes do with this passage in particular is we start with verse 6, which is where the poem, the poem part of it starts. Um, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be taken to his own advantage, and so on. But actually, I think we need to start this passage in verse 5, which says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in the very nature of God um, and, and just kind of sets the stage for Paul to, to center this passage in the whole letter that he's talking about unity. He's talking about his relationship with the Philippians. He's talking about their relationship with each other mm -hmm. and how that has all been changed by this movement of Jesus 
to us mm. in humiliation and then his exaltation by God the Father. That's good. Mm. So Philippians. Philippians. It's a good book. We'd love for you to read it with us. We'd love to get your feedback. Um, you can jump into any of these categories. If something stuck out to you, we'd love to hear that. Um, we haven't decided yet what book we'll uh, tackle for next week. So if you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear a book that you'd like to hear us converse about, have a conversation about. Um, it's been great to get back into this. Uh, let us know if you have any thoughts or questions, and we will see you next week.